Okay, we're in Luke chapter 23, if you want to open up your Bibles there. Luke chapter 23, we're going to be talking about verses 13 through 25 tonight. Of course, Jesus has been put on trial. He was arrested by the religious leaders who come with a detachment of troops, both some of the temple guard and Roman soldiers. Judas betrays him. Of course, Jesus is arrested and put on this illegal trial that takes place in the middle of the night, the religious leaders breaking their own rules. They knew that this was something they weren't supposed to do, but they're trying to have these things happen under the cover of darkness, kind of secretive in what's taking place. They're very much afraid of the crowds and the multitudes who, for the most part, Art, have received Jesus and his teaching, and so they're not trying to draw a whole lot of attention to themselves. They don't want the multitudes to be aware of what's going on. Of course, we know at this time, uh, during the Passover, Jerusalem would swell up to a couple million people, and so they're doing all of these things in the cover of darkness. They're also kind of trying to get their stories straight. Uh, one of the things that you have to remember, some of the enemies of Jesus, they weren't really friends they had their own problems, they had their own differences, and they would oftentimes argue. And so it's almost like they have to get their story straight. Okay, what is it that we're accusing them of? Uh, let's see what's really going to stick. And they have some false witnesses that come, and they put him through this trial. And now here they've brought him to Pilate. And you get the idea very quickly that Pilate really doesn't want to have anything to do with this whole issue either. Uh, Pilate is examining him, not able to find any kind of fault. Pilate is sort of bothered by the whole thing. We know from looking at all of the Gospels that very quickly Pilate was able to establish that really the religious leaders, they were jealous of Jesus. They were envious of Jesus. It was their own agenda that they were really trying to push, that they didn't have any legitimate accusation. That was something that Pilate was able to spot very early on. And yet it was his job to sort of keep the peace and make sure there wasn't any uprising or rebellion. So he's kind of delicately dealing with the whole situation. And as soon as Pilate finds out that, well, wait a minute, Jesus is a Galilean. Oh, well, that's Herod's jurisdiction. You know, Herod's going to have to deal with this. And so he very quickly sends him off to Herod. That doesn't buy him a whole lot of time because apparently Herod didn't really want to deal with Jesus either. And it would seem that he's maybe still wrestling with a little bit of guilt and conviction because he had John the Baptist put to death for no good reason. John the Baptist, all he said was Herod had run off with his brother Philip's wife and John the Baptist said, that's not right. And that was enough to have him arrested. That was enough now for this woman who was married to his brother. She says to him, hey, I want you to kill John the Baptist. I want his head on a platter. And so Herod goes along with it, knowing that he was a just man. You kind of get the impression there was something about John that Herod kind of liked. He kind of liked listening to him. You, you wonder, is there some small part of him that believes that John must be preaching the truth, but he has him killed? And so there were rumors going around that Jesus was somehow John the Baptist risen from the dead, and so he's dealing with a lot of demons. He's dealing with his own fears and anxieties and conviction. He doesn't want to have anything to do with Jesus either. And so after a little short encounter that Jesus has with Herod, and they rough him up a little bit, and they mock him, and they spit on him, and they put that glistening robe of white and silver, and so Jesus now comes back to Pilate, uh, here in our passage that we're going to be getting into tonight. What we're going to see is that Pilate is really trying to stay somewhere in the middle. He's trying to stay neutral. On one hand, he knows that there is real no legitimate accusation that's being brought against Jesus. He kind of sees right through what the religious leaders are doing. And yet he can't bring himself to just full-on confront them either. He can't bring himself to just say, hey, get out of here. As a matter of fact, I'm going to make sure that this Jesus is safe and he's protected from you guys. You're wild, you're crazy, you're having all of these accusations because you're envious. He can't bring himself to do that. And so he's trying to compromise. He's looking for little loopholes. How can I appease the religious leaders but not really do what they're asking me to do, but I'm not really taking a stand for Jesus either? And of course, the whole thing 
unravels. It never really works. It, trying to remain neutral. You can't remain neutral when it comes to Jesus. He is either who he claims to be, the Son of God, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and we have to bow down and we have to surrender to him, or we can reject him. Or we can claim that, well, I don't believe that he is who he says that he is. I don't believe what the Bible says is true. I'm not really sure if I believe in God at all. And whatever somebody might have to tell themselves to come to that place, whether they would be honest enough to say, you know, it's not that I don't believe or it's not that I couldn't consider his claims, but the reality is I don't want to bow down to anybody. I don't want there to be anyone that's the Lord of my life. And so as a result, I'm just going to reject this whole thing. I'm going to reject who Jesus is because I want to remain in that position of power. That's exactly what Pilate was trying to do. He was trying to remain in this position of power, which of course he's buying into the lie that somehow that's within his capability. How easily we forget that there's breath in our lungs that there's a beat in our heart because God allows it to be. Jesus, when he's interacting with Pilate, and Pilate is talking about all of this power that he has, Jesus is going to say to him, you would have no power at all unless it was given to you from above. The only reason you have power at all, Pilate, is because God is allowing it to take place. Well, there's this illusion that we all have that we're in control and that we can decide what our future is. And I don't want to submit, and I don't want to surrender. I don't want to listen to someone who's telling me how to live my life. I want to live it the way that I want because I can control the outcome. No, we cannot. No, there's breath in our lungs. And if we have any power at all, it's because God has allowed it to be. And so we should turn, and we should submit, and we should surrender. But we can't remain neutral. It never works. It doesn't work for Pilate. It certainly doesn't work for any of us. We're also going to be introduced to a man named Barabbas. Of course, he was the prisoner who was going to be released. It was the custom there of Rome to release one prisoner during the Passover to sort of keep the peace with Israel and in Jerusalem. And so it's Barabbas who is going to be released instead, and now Jesus is going to be crucified in his place. If there was ever anyone who could literally say, Jesus died for me, it was Barabbas. There's not a whole lot we know about him. We know that his name means son of the father, which is sort of ironic and interesting because here there's one son of the father who is going to be set free, and there's another son of the father who is going to pay the ultimate price, laying down his life. There's another son of the father that's going to die. And of course, this is the lens that the gospel is seen through. This is the lens that the love of God is seen through, that a father would send his son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. How much does God love the world? How much does God love you and God love me? He sent his son to die in your place, to take the punishment that you deserved. And so Barabbas, he's now a part of the story. All four gospels mention him. He's a part of the story and he could literally say, well, Jesus died in my place because he was convicted. He was guilty. That seems to be generally just understood and accepted. He was guilty. He was scheduled to be crucified and to die and on the day that that was going to take place, he was released, he was set free, and now Jesus is going to take his spot on the cross. And so there's a whole lot that we don't know about him, what he did with his freedom, how the rest of the story goes, but there is a very real sense in which every single believer in Jesus can relate to Barabbas. And so... That's what we're going to be looking at here tonight. I'll start at verse 13 and I'll read down to verse 17 and we'll get into our study. It says, Then Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people, said to them, 
You have brought this man to me as one who misleads the people. And indeed, having examined him in your presence, I have found no fault in this man concerning those things of which you accuse him. No, neither did Herod, for I sent you back to him, and indeed nothing deserving of death has been done by him. I will therefore chastise him and release him, for it was necessary for him to release one of them at the feast." And so Pilate says, look, you've brought to me this man saying he misleads the people. He's trying to cause some kind of rebellion. Uh, He's telling people not to pay taxes to Caesar. He's claiming to be a king. And so this is the reason that we've brought him to you. But he says, but I've examined him. Not only me, but Herod did also. And we haven't been able to find any fault in him for these accusations that you've brought. There's nothing that he's done that's deserving of death. And of course, that's what they're after. That's why they're going down this road. Rome had removed the right that they had to put anybody to death. If they were going to do it legally, they had to do it through the channels of Rome. Now, certainly we know that there were times where in the heat of the moment, they took that power back into their own hands. Here with Jesus... They seem to be a little afraid. They seem to be a little worried. You see that there in the Garden of Gethsemane when they show up with hundreds and hundreds of troops. They're a little bit afraid. They're a little bit worried. And so they want to go through these proper channels. Hey, if he's going to be put to death, then that has to happen through Rome so that we can't be blamed or that this can't backfire on us. And so they bring him to Pilate. And he's saying, look, we've checked him out. We've examined him, and we can't find any fault. That word examine, it's a legal term. It speaks of a judge who's looking at the evidence carefully. He's saying, I've examined him legally. I've scrutinized him, and I can't find any fault in this man. Now, there are plenty of things that we'll point out about Pilate and things that he did that were wrong or mistakes that he made and lies that he's sort of telling himself. But here's something we got to give to him. He did take the time. He really did examine. He really did scrutinize. He studied Jesus and what was being said about him and what Jesus' response was. He did take the time to truly consider. You know, there's many people who are living in our world today who seem to be content to gamble with their own lives, with their own eternity, They're willing to gamble, you know, what's the truth of life after death? What's the truth about heaven and hell? What's the truth about judgment? Many people willing to gamble all of those things who have never really considered what the Bible has to say. Never really considered the claims of Jesus Christ. And they'll say, well, you know, I don't know if I believe in the Bible. I don't know if I believe in Jesus. I don't know if I believe that he's really the only way. And of course, the question that should be asked is, have you examined him? Have you studied him? Are you just basing that off of what you've heard about Jesus through tradition or through some other person? Or have you really considered the source? Have you read through the Bible on your own? Have you read through a gospel? And have you said, God, if you're real, and if this is true, then speak to me. Reveal yourself to me. And here's the thing. The word of God is living and it's powerful and it's sharper than any two-edged sword and it'll pierce right into your life and God will speak to you. God will reveal himself to you. And of course, there's a part of an unbeliever that deep down knows that, which is of course why they don't consider the claims. I don't want to read the Bible. I don't want to go to church. I I don't want to hear the gospel because we recognize that these things have power. But it's an important question to ask. Have you ever really considered the claims of Jesus? Have you ever really considered the historical figure of Jesus of Nazareth? Because that's something that is universally understood. There really was a Jesus of Nazareth. He really did have followers. He really did have disciples. He really did have crowds of people who were coming after him. It was reported that he was doing miracles that he was this great teacher, that he was considered to be some prophet. We know that he was crucified. 
We know that he was buried. We know that three days later, the disciples said that he had risen from the dead and that they were eyewitnesses. And we know that they went to their death refusing to deny that they had seen the risen Jesus Christ. These are things that we know from history, which is why arguments against the resurrection are so weak. Arguments against the resurrection, they don't really make a lot of sense. Why? When we acknowledge all of those facts of history, you're sort of painted into this corner. Has someone really considered that? And listen, I know I'm preaching to the choir. I know that most of you have considered these things. But these are important questions to be asking. Our friends, our family, people that we come in contact with who don't know the Lord, who say, well, I don't know if I really believe in Jesus. I don't know if I really believe what the Bible says, I think it's an important question. Have you examined him for yourself? We can say all of these things about Pilate, and we will, (laughs) some of the mistakes that he made and some of the choices that he made, but one thing you can say is he did examine him. Uh, We know from John's gospel in John chapter 18 that there were times where Pilate, he would pull Jesus into closed quarters privately, and he would begin to speak to him. And he would say, well, are, are you a king And Jesus said, who's asking? (laughs) Are you asking me that or did someone tell you to say that? And Pilate got offended. And he's like, don't you know who I am? Don't you know the power that I have? And that's when Jesus said, oh, you'd have no power at all unless it was given to you from above. You say that I'm a king and you speak rightly. I am a king, but my kingdom is not of this world. And as Jesus began to share with him, to speak with him, there was something there in Pilate's heart. He's wrestling Because what Jesus is saying is ringing true. He knows the religious leaders are lying. And so as this whole thing is going on, he's becoming a little more and more afraid because he knows he's sort of on the wrong side of whatever's taking place here. And so here, Pilate, he's wrestling through these things. And we sometimes have to ask ourselves, have we considered the claims of Jesus? Would we pull him aside privately? Would we get into the word and listen to what he has to say? And so while he did examine him, unfortunately, Pilate compromises. We know that because he said, I find no fault in him. But there in verse 16, he says, but I'll chastise him and release him. Chastise him means I'll discipline him. I'll correct him. The word speaks of like bringing discipline to a young child. I'll teach him a lesson. Now, under Roman law, that shouldn't have been happening. He just said, I found no fault in him. So there shouldn't have been any correction. There shouldn't have been any discipline. And so this is Pilate trying to appease the religious leaders. Thinking, hey, if I throw him a bone, I can't find any fault in him, but look, we'll rough him up a little bit. We'll bring some discipline and correction, and then we're going to let him go. He's trying to compromise, breaking his own rules to hold on to his power. And it was a lie that he bought into that that was something he would be able to do. And listen, so many people, probably all of us in this room, at one point in time in our life or another, we've been guilty of it thinking that we can control things, thinking that we can hold on and remain in this position of power. You know, God asks us to do something and we start weighing out the risk and the reward. (laughs) Well, what will happen if I do that? And And we think that if we do it our way, that somehow we can come out on top, Uh, somehow we can create the situation where it's gonna benefit us. We know from history that wasn't the case for Pilate. Here he is, going against his own conscience, going against his own mind, going against his own laws, trying to appease the religious leaders. Why? So that he can keep the peace with them. Because he's already in trouble. He's there, he's ruling, he's the governor over Judea, not because this was a promotion. Uh, We know that Caesar is keeping a close eye on him. We know that his career is sort of declining We know that there have been rebellions and uprises there in Jerusalem, some of which he was directly responsible for. It was his own cruelty. It was his own poor leadership that led to some of those things. So he's in hot water with Rome. 
So he's thinking, well, I, I got to appease these religious leaders because if I have one more big fiasco, that could be the end for me. And so he compromises all of these things that he knows are true to try to hold on to that position of power. And yet we know from history that wasn't the case. Within 10 years, he's going to be removed from office. He's going to be banished. He's actually going to end up committing suicide. That's the end of Pilate. So his little attempt to hold on to that position of power, to compromise what he knew to be true in his heart, that didn't work out for him in the end. A pilot sort of becomes the epitome of what Jesus had taught about earlier. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? Oh, you had everything that the world had to offer and you had all of that power and you had all of that authority and you had all of that luxury what profit is it if in the end you've lost it all and now you're going to face eternity without God? Now you're going to face eternity in light of your own judgment and all of your sin that you're now going to be held responsible for. He says, I'm not going to bow down though. I'm not going to bow down to God. I'm not going to bow down to Jesus. And there are people today who say that very same thing. I'm not going to bow down. You don't bow down to Jesus. You're going to bow down to someone. You're going to bow down to something. There's going to be some sin. There's going to be some vice. There's going to be some compromise that you bow down to and serve. And the horrible masters that those sin and that vice can become. Jesus is the much better master. He's the one that we should be bowing down and surrendering to. Pilate thinks he can walk this fine line, remaining in the middle, remaining neutral, compromising, trying to hold on to a position of power. He says, I'll chastise him and release him. Then there at verse 17, it says it was necessary for him to release one of them at the feast. That is something that Rome had started to do. Again, as a gesture of peace to the Jewish people, that during the Passover, they would release one of the prisoners. So there in verse 18, it says, And they all cried out at once, saying, Away with this man, and release to us Barabbas, who had been thrown into prison for a certain rebellion made in the city and for murder. Pilate, therefore, wishing to release Jesus again, called out to them, but they shouted, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Then he said to them the third time, Why? What evil has he done? I have found no reason for death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. But they were insistent, demanding with loud voices that he be crucified. And the voices of these men and of the chief priest prevailed. You know, every once in a while, evil shows its face. We've seen that throughout history. Uh, we've seen it through world history. We've seen it through American history. We, we see it today. Every once in a while, evil shows its face. You know, the Bible says that we don't really battle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and spiritual hosts of wickedness and heavenly places. And sometimes that's hard to see because it really feels like Bill is the problem, or it feels like George is you know, really causing all of these issues. Sorry if you're Bill or George. I just picked two random names. You know, sometimes it really does seem like our wrestle is against flesh and blood. Every once in a while, though, it's like the veil is removed, and you can see the enemy in full force, and you see some of the evil things that are just being spit from his mouth. This is one of those times. Hear the crowd they're just insistent. No, crucify him. Oh yeah, it's the priest. They're down there in the crowd and they're persuading people. And maybe there's a little bit of fear. Maybe there's a little bit of manipulation, but they're just screaming out. No, crucify him. Think about that. Crucifixion. This horrible, horrible, torturous form of death usually taking days. I think 13 days was the longest crucifixion on record. Just a horrible, excruciating, slow death. And here's Pilate, this secular pagan guy. Like, really? You know, this is what you want to do? I can't find any fault. And they're just screaming out, crucify him. Oh, this is demonic. 
This is satanic. And every once in a while, the veil is lifted and you kind of see evil for what it truly is. Now again, all four Gospels mention this Barabbas. We know from Matthew's Gospel that it was Pilate who suggested specifically, who gave this ultimatum, this alternative. You can, you can pick Jesus or you can pick Barabbas. And what that tells us is Pilate must have really thought that Jesus would have been the obvious choice between the two. What that tells us is Barabbas didn't have a lot of friends. Whatever he was involved in, he wasn't the Robin Hood of the people. He wasn't winning any popularity contest. We know it says that he led some rebellion. It says that he was a murderer. And who knew? Who knew the whole story? Who knew all of the stuff that he did? But it would seem that Pilate thought, okay, if I give the choice between Barabbas and Jesus, well, surely they'll choose Jesus because Barabbas, everybody knows, is this horrible individual. And then they start screaming out, no, give us Barabbas. We want the murderer. We want that unpopular guy. Give us Barabbas. We want you to crucify Jesus. We want you to have him put to death. We also know that it was during this time that Pilate's wife comes to him. And she says, I've suffered many things this night in a dream because of this man you don't have anything to do with him. Don't have anything to do with this Jesus. And the language there is, is really intense. What she was saying is, don't let there be any negative issue at all between you and Jesus. Don't let anything like that get in between you and Jesus. That's what she says. That's good advice. It's advice that Pilate's gonna wrestle with. It's gonna weigh heavy when he's hearing all of these things when he's listening to the way that Jesus responds, when he watches Jesus absorb some of the wrath and some of the judgment and all of the punishment that's going to come his way, and when Jesus claims to be the Son of God, Pilate's afraid. He's scared. He knows there's something else going on here. And so his wife comes to him and says, hey, I've had this horrible dream. Trust me, don't have anything to do with this Jesus. Don't let there be anything in between you and Jesus that would be bad, that would be negative, I'm telling you. And so Pilate wrestles with that, unfortunately doesn't listen. Good advice nonetheless. Don't let there be anything between you and Jesus. And the weird, dumb, foolish things that sometimes we'll hold on to. And we know it's not what the Lord would have. We know it's not helping our relationship with him. We know that it's providing some kind of a distance and yet we hold on to it and we make exceptions for it and wanna make provisions for it. It's good advice for anyone to consider, a believer or an unbeliever. Don't let there be anything that would get in between you and Jesus. But here, Pilate again, trying to appease the religious leaders and now the crowd that they're stirring up, his last ditch effort is to scourge Jesus. Uh, we know that there's gonna be one last time where Pilate is gonna present Jesus to the religious leaders and give them an opportunity to show some kind of mercy and it's after he has him beat and has him scourged. Scourged with the cat of nine tails. Of course, that could be a lethal form of punishment all on its own. 40 lashes was supposed to be you were gonna be dead. And so they would give 40 minus one. They'd give 39 lashes to bring you right up to the point of death. And of course, that cat of nine tails, these long leather straps with these little metal beads at the end of it. And all along the leather strap, there would be bone and glass and things embedded in there so that when the strap came down, it would stick into human flesh. And when the strap was pulled away, it would rip off human flesh. And we know that that was something that the Romans did to solve unsolvable crimes, to get to the bottom of a situation. As those lashes would be coming down, if you would confess... If you would acknowledge guilt, if you would give up names, if you would give up information, all of those things could make the blows a little bit less. 
All of those things could make the punishment a little bit more easy to endure. But if someone were to remain silent, if someone refused to confess, if someone wasn't given up any names or any information, well then the lashes got more and more intense and we know Jesus remained silent. And so we could only be left to believe that these lashes, they just get more and more intense. And so we're talking his back and his, his rib cage being ex exposed. We know that he's taking blows to the face. Oftentimes those blows to his face coming while his head is covered or without warning. We know from Isaiah chapter 50 verse 6, it says, I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard and I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. There in Isaiah, we're told that the Messiah would have his beard ripped from his face. It's in Isaiah chapter 52 that says that his visage was marred more than any man. And the language there in Isaiah 52 would indicate to us that he wasn't recognizable. And we're sort of left to debate and wonder, was he not recognizable as Jesus? Or was he not recognizable as a human being? As now he's just, his face has been opened up and his body has been opened up and his back has been opened up and they put this crown of thorns on his head and so blood is just gushing everywhere. And they put a royal robe on him and then Pilate brings him back out to the religious leaders in the crowd one last time and he says, behold the man. Look at, look at what he's endured Look at what he's been through. I know the accusations that you've brought against him. Now, consider all that he's been through already. Uh, that's enough. It's time I should let him go. And that's when they continue to scream out, no, we want Barabbas. We want you to crucify Jesus. And so Pilate's attempt to compromise and appease the religious leaders is all for nothing. And so verse 24, it says, Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they requested. And he released to them the one that they requested, who for rebellion and murder had been thrown into prison, but he delivered Jesus to their will. And so he does release to them Barabbas. Again, Barabbas means son of the father. And we're sort of left to guess, you know, how did he get that name? How does Barabbas get the name son of the father? I mean, you kind of get the idea that he must have been sort of a chip off the old block. You know, when we say, oh, that's his father's son right there. We all kind of know what we're talking about. You know, if my sons do something really kind and great and wonderful, it's his father's son right there. I mean, we all understand, you know, how we use that expression. Barabbas, he, he's his father's son. What does that mean? Well, goodness, everything we know about Barabbas is he's a horrible person. He's a murderer. He was the guy that Pilate thought for sure, okay, well, we're not that cruel. We're not that mean. Uh, Barabbas should be put to death. Everything that we know about him would tell us that he wasn't a good person at all. And so whatever his temperament, whatever his personality Whatever character traits he had of his father doesn't seem to be all that positive. What we know about him is that he was guilty, that he was sentenced to death. And Pilate offers him up as an alternative thinking, well, surely they're going to release Jesus. But instead, there's another son of the father that's going to die in his place. Jesus said to the disciples, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So Jesus, the Son of the Father, He is the exact representation of His Father in heaven, and yet He's the one who's going to be crucified. And unlike Barabbas, He was totally innocent. They could find no fault in Him, but He's the one who's going to be going to the cross He's going to die in the place where Barabbas should have been. I mean, can you imagine what this day was like for Barabbas? How much he knew about Jesus. I'm sure that he'd heard about him, 
I'm sure that he was aware everybody in Jerusalem was talking about Jesus, but how long he had been in this place, how long he had been arrested waiting for this sentence, we don't know all of those details. But can you imagine the day that he's supposed to go to the cross and have and experience one of the most excruciating deaths ever designed, this form of torture, suddenly they're calling for his name. And he's probably thinking, oh, that's it. My day has come. This is my time. I'm guilty. I've been convicted. The cross is waiting ahead of me, and now they're calling out my name. This is it. Only to be set free. Only to be standing there now with Jesus, this beaten, bloodied mess. And they're saying, no, Barabbas, we want you to have, you know, set him free, and Jesus is going to be put to death. Can you imagine? everything that was going through his mind. And of course, we don't know all of the details there. We don't know what he did with his freedom and how he responded to those things. But as much as we look at that story and we think, oh, this is just evil and this is so wrong and they're screaming out for Jesus to be crucified while this murderer goes free. And yet we have to stop and acknowledge that's the gospel. That's your story. That's my story. We were like Barabbas. We were convicted. We were guilty. We have the sentence of death over us. And then Jesus, the perfect spotless lamb, the son of the father, the son of God, came and lived and died in our place. Took the punishment that we deserve. Barabbas didn't earn it. He didn't work for it. That He had no participation at all. He's now just set free. And so you and I, as we come to faith in Christ, it's not our works, it's not our good deeds, it's simply receiving what Jesus has done on our behalf. You know, we can look at Pilate and we can consider all of the compromise, this lie that he bought into, that if I remain neutral, if I kind of stay in the middle, as long as I don't offend these people, don't offend these people, I can hold on to my place And he resists his own conscience. He he resists the obvious truth that's right in front of him. And of course, for Pilate and the religious leaders, you have to think that so much of what's taking place here, it's for their benefit. Of course, God loves them and God cares about them. And they're wrestling with all of these things. Here, God is pleading with them. Don't you see what you're doing? Don't you see the direction that you're going in? Don't you see how this is a mistake? You need to turn. You need to repent. And God's faithful. God's faithful to wrestle with us when we're resisting him, when we're rejecting him, when we're considering going in a direction without him. He's faithful and he's good and he's merciful to plead with us and give us opportunities to turn and give us opportunities to repent. We could look at Barabbas and say, well, he was guilty and he was condemned and yet he would be set free. But at the end of the day, more so than how guilty is Pilate, how foolish was he that he thought he could wash his hands of this whole thing? Or what about the religious leaders? And they knew the Bible and they should have known better. More than anything else, I think the Lord would say to us, well, what about you? What have you done with the Son of God? Will you behold the man? Will you consider who Jesus is and his claims and receive what he's done? Will we recognize that as the crowd is screaming out, crucify him, will we recognize that our own sin screams out, crucify him? That even though this is a picture of evil, even though it's a picture of Satan, just revealing his true character and nature, even though it's a picture of how depraved human beings can be, it's also a picture of God being in total control. God loving us so much that he sent his son to die in our place. And will we recognize that it was our own sin that screams out, crucify him? And will we simply receive the greatest gift that's ever been offered to humanity? Will we simply receive Jesus And not only did he live, but he died. He died for me. He died for my sin. He died that we could be forgiven. He rose again 
conquering sin, conquering death, will, re will we receive what he's done on our behalf. Let's come before the Lord together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for who you are. We thank you for your love and your mercy and for your grace. God, I thank you for each person here, all those who would listen to this message. Lord, I just pray that you would meet with them in a very personal way. God, we know that you are faithful to meet us where we're at. We know that you love us and that you care about us. And when there's someone who isn't right with you, we know that the attention of heaven is upon them. And so, Lord, I just pray if there's anyone here tonight and they know they're not right with you, Lord, I pray tonight would be the night that they say, yes, Jesus, come into my life. Yes, I want to surrender to who you are. I don't want to live life apart from you for another moment. Lord, I pray tonight would be the night that they surrender and that they put their faith and trust in you. Lord, for those of us who know you and love you, uh, we thank you so much for the sacrifice that was made on our behalf. Lord, we don't want there to be anything that would come between us. And so we thank you for the cross. We thank you for your blood that was shed. And we ask, Lord, that you'd wash us and cleanse us and renew us, fill us with your spirit. We want to see you glorified in our lives. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together.